Now that we have found a way of plotting the motion of our prismatic joint, it is time to complete our study of motion control with an algorithm called PID. We have actually already started our study of this control algorithm because the P in PID stands for proportional. We already implemented proportional control. That was the algorithm where we set the motor speed as a constant times the error in the rack positioning. We called the constant the gain, and we saw, by eye at least, the effects of changing the gain. Before we look at the I and D parts of PID control today, let's take a moment to use our new ability to plot the rack motion to quantify the effects of a changing KP gain. Let's do this. First, set KP to 1. And program the PSOC. Then slide the slider all the way to the right, reset the PSOC, and plug in the power supply. Now run the Python code. When it finishes, go open up the data file. Remember that the data file is this text file that you created in the same folder as your Python code. Copy the values in the data text file and then paste the values into a column in Excel. Create another column to the left of that column called time. We'll create this time column the same way we did in the last video. We know that each one of these numbers is 10 milliseconds away from the other number. Label this column KP equals 1. Now, back in the PSOC code, change KP to 2 and program the PSOC. Slide the slider to the right, and then reset the PSOC. Plug in your external power supply, and then run the Python code again. If your data text file is still open, close it, and then open it again. Copy all of the values, and then paste them into another column in Excel, and label this column KP equals 2. Let's do one more test. Set KP equal to 3, and program the PSOC. Slide the slider all the way over, reset the PSOC and then run the Python code. After it finishes, open up the data file, copy all the values, and paste them into the third column of Excel. We'll call this column KP equals 3. Now, I'd like to see all of these values plotted on the same plot. So I'm going to highlight all four columns and then do insert a scatter plot. And here we have plots for KP equal to 1, 2, and 3. It's really hard to see here because the markers are big. Let's see if we can change that. Right click on the data points and then select Format Data Series. In these format options, there are a couple of things that are most useful to change. If you change the line width to be smaller, 
or even zero that will help and also if you go to the marker options and reduce the size of the marker and you can also change the type of the marker to be something like a dash instead of a dot and that will help reduce the marker size so that you can see the difference in the paths for the different values of KP. Feel free to change these however you'd like so that the path looks good to you and you can see the difference between the different paths. Once you have the markers looking the way you like, set this plot aside and this time we're going to highlight only the values that go up through one second and we'll create this plot again. This kind of plot is known as a time response. It's called that because the x-axis is time, and the plot shows how the joint responds to our control over time. We already know that we are interested in the trade-off between speed, stability, and accuracy of the control. Now, we can measure those things from this plot. Here's how we can measure them. I'm going to create a table to hold the measures that we make. I'll make the first column of the table be the KP value, and we tested three values, one, two, and three. The first time value we're interested in is something called the rise time. The rise time is the time it takes from when the motion starts until the joint first reaches the target position. If we look carefully at our plot, we can see that for all three of these, the rise time occurs somewhere in here. And we can see that the gray dots, that is KP3, has the shortest rise time, and the blue has the next shortest rise time, and then the orange has the longest rise time. We can get the value more easily from these numbers here. I'm going to start scrolling down and remember that our target position is 1000. So I'm going to look for the point at which we first reach 1000. For KP3, 1000 is reached somewhere between 0.22 and 0.23. I'm going to use 0.23, the first value that is greater than or equal to 1000. For KP equals 1, the value is 0.24, and for KP equals 2, it's also 0.24. Another speed value that we're interested in is something called the peak time. Peak time is just what it sounds like, the amount of time it takes from when the motion starts until it reaches its first maximum value or its first peak. So if I scroll down in these numbers, I'm looking for a value that is the maximum. For KP equals 1, here I have the first peak. The value before and the value after are both less than this value. So the peak time for KP equals 1 is 0.27. Let's look at KP equals 2. Here I have a value where the values before and after are both less than it. So the peak time for KP equals 2 is also 0 0.27. For KP equals 3, it looks like the peak is maybe right here. The values before and after are both less than this value, so its peak time is 0 0.25. For peak time and rise time, 
a smaller number is better. And in general, as Kp gets larger, these values should go down. As Kp gets smaller, the rise time and the peak time should increase. Now there's one more time value that kind of crosses the boundary between being a measure of speed and being a measure of stability, and this is called the settling time. The settling time is the amount of time from when the motion starts until the motion no longer oscillates. Let's look down at Kp equals 1. It looks like the motion stops at a position of 985 and 0.44 is the first time at which it reaches 985 and no longer changes. So we'll record 0.44 as our settling time for Kp equals 1. Let's look at Kp equals 2. For Kp equals 2, it looks like the value settles on 997 and that happens at time 0.52. Now let's look at Kp equals 3. It looks like it settles on 1002 and that happens at 0.67. Now the trend of settling time is opposite the trend of peak time and rise time. As Kp gets larger, peak time and rise time get smaller, but settling time becomes larger. That's because as Kp increases, the stability decreases. In other words, the control becomes less stable. Let's do the other measure of stability here. The other measure of stability is overshoot. The overshoot is a percentage, and it's the amount that the response exceeds the target position at its peak. If we scroll down for Kp equals 1, and we find its peak, the peak value for Kp equals 1 is 1,104. The amount that we were trying to move was a distance of 1,000. So in order to calculate the overshoot, we'll take 1,104 minus 1,000 to get 104. That's how much the response overshot. And now we want to express that as a percentage. So it's 104 divided by 1,000, the amount that we were moving. Also, this should be expressed as a percent. There we go, we have 10.4% overshoot for Kp equals 1. Let's look at Kp equals 2. The peak value is 1097. And then for Kp equals 3, our peak value is 1088. Now the trend that you see with my numbers here is actually opposite the way the trend typically goes. As Kp becomes larger, the amount of overshoot generally increases. These numbers that I have here are probably within the amount of error within one run, and if I ran this again, we would get slightly different values. We'll see in a moment that as we decrease Kp, the overshoot will decrease also. So far, these first two values have to do with speed, and these two values have to do with stability. There's still one more measure we need, and that is accuracy. For accuracy, the value we're most interested in is something called steady state error. Steady state error is how much error there is in the positioning after the response has stopped oscillating. So if I scroll down for Kp equals 1, I see that it settles on 985. 
So the steady state error is equal to 1,000 minus 985 or 15. We could convert this 15 to an actual linear position. But for now, all we're doing is comparing the amount for different values of kp. And so we can leave it in units of counts of the encoder for now. kp equals 2 settles on 997. So that's a steady state error of 3. And for kp equals 3, it settles on 1002. So that's a steady state error of 2. The steady state error is always positive, so we take the absolute value of the difference between the target position and the actual position. This trend that you see here is the trend that we typically see. As KP becomes larger, the steady state error will become smaller. So here we have two values that are about speed, two values that are about stability, and one value that is about accuracy. In the next video, we'll take a look at how we can use these numbers to find a good control algorithm and good control gains for our controller.